Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Yonja Karakalic, and I am the director of the Arts Transcending Borders program here at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's artist talk featuring Kevork Murad about his installation work, Memory Gates. We started our virtual programming this fall with a visit to his Brooklyn studio and shared at the time that conditions permitting, he would come into the college for a 10 day period to create an immersive installation at the Cantor Art Gallery. Well, today marks the culmination of that residency and you will soon be able to see the complete work and hear about the process as well as the themes explored. We at Arch Transcending Borders have had the distinct pleasure of working with Kevork several times since 2017 when we hosted his mesmerizing on-stage collaboration with clarinetist Kina Nasmek. I am very grateful to our colleagues at Cantor Art Gallery as well as the College Administration for building on this relationship with us and creating yet another opportunity to explore his amazing range of artistry. Coming in every morning and seeing the work afresh in light of new layers additions has been a special, very special experience. Students have come in one or two at a time to help him bring this work to life. Others have stopped by and marveled at what the imagery evokes, often bringing their own past experiences into the act of meaning making, which the artist encourages us to do, but more on that shortly. So once again, thanks very much for tuning in today. I encourage you to engage in the conversation, put your questions or comments in the chat box to the right side of your screen. And the stream is being recorded, so it will be available at the same link on our YouTube page, as well as the special exhibition website. I'd now like to pass it on to Meredith Fluke, who is the director of the Cantor Art Gallery, and she will be our host today. Enjoy. Good afternoon and welcome to Memory Gates, an immersive exhibition by artist Kevork Murad at the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Art Gallery at the College of the Holy Cross. I'm Meredith Fluke, director of the Cantor, and I'm here with Kevork, who joins us today to talk with us about his project. Before we get started, just a quick note on format. In a few minutes, I will cede the floor to Kevork, who will walk us through Memory Gates. After that, Kevork and I will have a discussion in which the audience is welcome to ask questions and you are able to pose a question to Kevork by using the chat function on the right side of your screen. I would also like to say a quick thank you to Janja Karkilik, Director of Arts Transcending Borders here at Holy Cross and Jess Melton, the ATB Fellow, with who the Cantor has partnered to bring Kevork as an artist in residence to campus to Ian Kalinganides, Bob Henry, John Buckingham, and the entire EdTech team here at Holy Cross, who have been working with us to make a website that you can visit at www.memorygates.holycross.edu, and have worked alongside Pagano Media to create a virtual experience of the exhibition for you to enjoy at home, and I hope you will. To the Holy Cross students, faculty, and administration for supporting this absolutely crazy idea to host an artist in residence during a pandemic and who came to help cut um, work and cheer on the progress um, all along the way. And mm, to my wonderful colleagues here at the Cantor, Paula Rosenblum and Tim Johnson, who have worked side by side with Cave Work for long and some intense hours uh, to make this happen in 10 days. And of course, my depth of gratitude goes to Cave Work Rod who has brought this absolutely beautiful and transformative work to the Holy Cross campus. Um, through this process, you have taken us on a journey. Um, we have learned so much from you. It's been intense, it's been informative, and it's been absolutely unique. So 
Um, we are so glad that we've had you here. So for those of you who are watching at home, I just want to set the scene for a second. Um, when Kay Bork arrived here 10 days ago uh, to be the artist in residence here at Holy Cross, all he had with him was a bolt of fabric, a bucket of paint, some paint brushes, uh, some cutting tools, um, and himself. So all of the things that you see and you will see as, we, as Kay Bork takes you on a tour today in the gallery are things that have been created here in this space over the past 10 days. Um, we came with some plans and we have made others. Um, Kay Bork has brushed, he's printed, he's cut, he's drawn, and he has hung his way to this amazing installation that you see here behind us. Um, we're so lucky that he has stayed with us for 10 days and for this last hour um, so that we can hear a little bit about the exhibition and we can do a walkthrough with him. So Kay Vork, please Thank you show us much. what you've done. And let's go. Let me share my thoughts about making this piece possible. So here we are. I'm expecting this piece to be visited in person. Visitors are welcome to go in, so don't think this is too precious to not experience this from inside. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is I won't. Visitors, students, anyone, when they walk in, they start getting this flash of memories based on these images here. So um, quickly, I'm just going to explain how I created those and the, the process behind it. When you pay attention to the lines and the gestures, you realize mainly it's kind of very fast, improvised lines. So I'm interested in thinking about how there are certain informations hidden in subconscious, but far, far deep inside you. When, I, when you're creating some things, all of a sudden you're surprised by your own lines. So those lines will kind of give you an idea of what you, you had, or what experience you had in the past. Like could be images, could be um, places that you visited. So here, when I'm working fast, I'm creating a place, let's say, uh, a window from Aleppo, and remembering vaguely what was it like when I was five, six year old walking in the neighborhood in an old part of Aleppo, thinking how I'm going to take this with me. And here you are, I just brought the part of it, just the memory. And then thinking about when I was a kid, learning from, uh, let's say, art books, like European uh, prints and things like that. And I realized automatically, I did not plan to create this like that, but the lines kind of inspired me to think very deep past in time to combine two types of memories. One, what you remember from the past, and the other, this subconscious um, effortless kind of images that comes and you make something out of it. Almost like thinking the image was there before, you're just revealing and removing the dust or the sand off the surface. So when you start paying attention, you realize there's two main things happening here. Hard surface, which is the, let's say, the stones or carvings, and the soft one, the fabric. The fabric almost, it stitches between the, the elements, those kind of blocks of uh, memories and images that I kind of borrowed from my past. And the fabric here, it's playing two important roles for me. One is giving this almost like a melody is flying over from place to place to connect all this together so they don't fall down. And the other one, which is very powerful, during the Syrian uh, uprisings, the snipers were hitting, killing people left and right, and people decided to protect themselves. They collected the sum and put this huge fabric so they can go to their daily work behind the fabric, hidden from the snipers. And I thought about this, what an incredible thing. Fabric can save lives. And here, can fabric also protect civilizations? It's kind of symbolically put it in two places. So let's continue and see some of the gestures. I'm also fascinated by the idea of, if you're a contemporary artist, you have a very important role to document your time. Mm -hmm. To document your time in, in two ways. One, you could be thinking about how to protect civilizations, like my own ancestors 
Armenians and growing up in Syria, and also thinking about how to give back to the people who kind of host your ancestors, because my ancestors, when they arrived to Syria, they were refugees. So let me just bring you to one important thing here. Of course, we heard about arches, because the title of the exhibit is uh, kind of gates and memory gates and arches. So here in this element, I'm trying to create something kind of resembles language, calligraphy. But it doesn't say anything. It's just a gesture that I borrowed from Arabic and Armenian writing. I try to create kind of layers that you can go back in time. And so symbolically, I wanted to end up creating this old door, which has this precious feeling to it. It looks like my great grandparents, they gave it to me. They said, OK, hold on to this, because this was symbolically our way to start a new life in a new land when they came to, to Syria. And here, I feel like it's important for visitors to understand opening doors is one of the most beautiful thing and important thing. You can't just seal people from your life. You should just include them to your life mm -hmm. to be able to create a new ways, a new ways to be tolerance and be kind of open for tomorrow. Otherwise, you cannot just live alone. You have to interact. So I wanted to kind of be that in a center to think about ancient civilizations, because if we don't, as an artist, we don't document that, it might disappear. I'm not even sure if I go back to Aleppo, I'm going to see those old homes and beautiful arches, beautiful doors. So I said, you know what? I'm going to rely on my own memories and capture it. And hopefully, one day, future generations, they'll say, oh, how wonderful that we can go back to places just by visiting artworks and maybe create a new type of architecture inspired by art. So here, when you come here and you start kind of seeing how things are connected, almost like borrowed from different cultures, different civilizations, different languages, you know, different images here, there, I wasn't afraid any image could kind of interfere from this composition. I just welcomed everything, like creating a new way of mythological a character like is the dragon or a rooster like just it was a wonderful experience because I felt very comfortable being in this space and I said you know what I just want to improvise and create something about all of us so it doesn't matter who can come and visit here they feel they're part of this and it triggers wonderful experience and memories in them and they will create their own narrative about the piece and we could also see it closely, all the gestures here. Like, for example, Lonely King, uh, something like Virginia Woolf here. Mm -hmm. They all kind of came. I didn't even use any images, just wanted to improvise and create something looking old, like I borrowed from the old culture. So we can come out of here and enter here. Like it's purposely creating this broken tile, almost like a broken granite sculpture. Mm. It's like you can feel you can go to another time, mm -hmm. almost like jumping to another time. Yeah, come in here. Welcome back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for showing yeah. everyone sort of through the memory gates. Um, you know, as Kay Bork has said, it's, it is important to, if you can, to come and see this installation. If you can't, you visit the website, you watch videos, you see all of the interviews, and you can get um, a sense of what Kay Bork was working on here. Um, this is a great time if you want to post any questions. I'm happy to, um, you know, feed them to Kay Bork. And of course, I have, you know, my own questions that uh, I've, I've been thinking about. So 
Um, just to set the scene a little bit, um, I know Cave Work's work because I've seen it uh, installed at the Rose Art Museum uh, about a few years ago. I saw it and I was absolutely blown away. Uh, I, it was a you know, piece about destruction and destruction of cities and you know, I'm an architectural historian and an archeologist and I just responded so, so strongly to, to Cave Work's work. Um, I came to Holy Cross about a year and a half ago, a little less. And I heard, I was you know, talking to Yanja, thinking about Art Transcending Borders, and Cave Work's name came up. And I said, oh, have you, have you ever heard of Cave Work? You guys know Cave Work Murad? And they said, oh, yes, we've had this project. We've been working on with him for years. Um, and I was so excited to hear. So it was, it, I was so happy that you had already this established relationship with Holy Cross. Um, and I immediately thought about you know, what we could do in the canter, in this space. Um, and I was interested because the Holy Cross community has seen um, a lot of illustration. They've seen, you know, they've seen your pieces that um, Home Within, and they've seen pieces you've done, you know, with music. Um, this has no music to accompany it. Um, it's a different kind of piece in that way, but it's deeply connected to the things that you did before. So can you talk a little bit about the conception pro process for this project here, you know, what you were thinking about knowing you were walking into the space you know, with your fabric over your shoulder and what you hoped to achieve in the process. So this probably, this work is my seventh installation piece. I call it drawing sculptures. Um, but specifically for this space and this time, I wanted to achieve something which is very important for me. We are, I'm hoping that we're coming out of the pandemic. So basically we are deprived from being in the same space with any art. So can I create a work where visitors can get the maximum out of any experience they had before to enter inside the work? So these two things were very important thing for me to kind of Give them hope that we're coming out of the pandemic because you're allowed to come in and be in the same space and breathe the same air with the artwork. So I think that was my main goal. Second, I wanted to also create something very dense, reflects on the civilizations in general, that sometimes we take things for granted that, yes, they're all there in the books and sometimes in the movies. But how is it when you create artwork it's raw. My work is, I consider it raw. Everything is there. It means all the lines are there. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not erasing anything. When you're allowing the visitors to come and see things closely, first of all, it could be vulnerable. When you zoom out, it could be beautiful. So to combine these two works together, it's an interesting way to inspire the visitors to think, yes, maybe out of this work, they could create something interesting. And basically, we want to inspire others to create beauty and to preserve culture. So those were kind of main things I was thinking about. And then the rest, you know. <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. Um, you know, w one of the things that the students and, and, and faculty and, and um, various colleagues have been just in, you know, really tuned in about, and, and we've done some live sessions with you is your process, um, which is so much a part of you know, who you are and the mm -hmm. way that your art looks. And so if you could just quickly sh tell us how this becomes what we're seeing here, right? Starting with a white sheet. Um, and I can see that we have some process questions to answer. So uh, as I said, you know, this is my seventh project. Every project I do, it kind of gives an idea how to push the envelope to the next level. So I think until now, this is the only one that you could actually walk in it. So knowing that's my goal, to let the visitors walk inside of work, so it means there need to be layered. So I decided that needs to be two or three layers. When you create work, flat work on a uh, fabric, this is fabric work, cotton, uh, and you start imagining what's going to be in front of it or behind it. 
So with work, you think about, OK, uh, one of them needs to be denser, lots of information there. The other one, the front, needs to be less. So with that, you started thinking how the composition is going to be kind of developed and arranged, because you cannot ignore what's going to be in the front. At the end, it's going to be one work. So you have to think about this balance continuously. Like you have so many instruments, you're going to compose a song or music. Then you have to think about every element. At the end, from distance, you're going to hear one melody. And that is a very important goal. So creating those monotypes piece by piece. So I create them in the small plates. So I'm, I'm working with paint. I kind of apply the paint on uh, acetate, which is a transparent uh, plastic and then reverse press. And I put the transparent plastic on the print after I print it. So I trace what's next to it, because they have to be in a conversation, as I said. Slowly, piece by piece, that one piece inspires the next one and the next one composition-wise, not idea-wise. So composition-wise, it needs to be speaking to each other to be able to have this one big piece. It looked like one big print doesn't look like a small fragments. And then we invite the students. We'll make the marks where it needs to be cut. Once you cut that, it's ready to be hung with the other layers. So in this printing process, um, this is, you know, maybe, maybe it's just the way I, I think. But um, you know, in, in, the, in the Middle Ages, which is what I study, the act of printing, is often, you know, the idea of pressing something into something else is often equated to memory, right? That you take something and you press it into your brain is kind of the, always the image that's used for making memories. And so I'm wondering if there's any, for you, any association with that sort of act of, of making, the act of pressing and printing with this idea of memory. Are those connected together? The process is very interesting because you're thinking about something. But before I start applying the pain, paint, I know approximately what I'm creating there. Because I need to have the idea if this is going to be figure or a portrait. So it's going to be, let's say, animal or human. So there's something very unusual in the process of a spontaneously right away reflecting. There's like a split second to decide how you're creating this. And I think that is related 100% to memory, certain memory that you're not visiting that memory very often. Because the more you visit the memory, the more you blur that memory, even distort that memory. So it's somehow feel like there is a way, if you start exploring these things, you could understand yourself better because you're creating it so fast, and then you're surprising yourself that, yes, you wanted to create that, but without knowing that you're creating that. It's kind of an interesting reversing. And again, let's not forget, anything I create, it's going to look reversed. Right. I also have to think about that. Right. So calligraphy, when I'm trying to think about Arabic calligraphy, I am thinking about Armenian calligraphy, because mm. they're opposite each other. So if I'm going to write in Armenian, I have to look to create the look of the Arabic. But if I'm going to think about Armenian, I have to look because <laughs> you're going to print it and it's going to look reverse. So very interesting kind of a game to think about how you could change things, but again, look like the way you want yeah. to show. Yeah. I'm going to take a, a, a question from Noah Scheindlinger, which I think is related to what we're talking about here. So um, Noah is saying, the flip side of memory is forgetfulness. What role does it play in the process of creating your installation? So I think I was explaining earlier about the idea of you never know if you're going to go back and see the places that you used to live. Like uh, What I mean in that once you capture something, you feel safer that you have it with you. I think we think about you know, the way we have our smartphones. We start taking pictures. Once you take a picture, you feel more comfortable that you take, took moment, that moment with you. And as an artist, I always think that how can I capture my time? And how can I just feel um, 
that this process is giving something to us. Because at the end of the day, I'm not creating work to decorate people's home. I want to say something meaningful that someone else can understand that. So once I create that, I feel like I captured something and I feel better about the time I'm living in. So in, in, in this way, it's OK for me to forget what I was doing because I already captured it. And then you go on to another place. Because you cannot live in the same moment all the time. You have to get move forward. So when I capture this, it's OK, I forget this. Maybe I'm going to forget about this installation to move into the another thing. So I think that is what I'm trying to associate with this question. Great. Um, I think I'll ask Ariana Moore's question, which is, how does memory gates connect culture and memory? And I think this is related. What is the function of art in aiding or adding, adding to our memories? Mm. Um, if you're living with someone who's losing their memory, you're obviously trying to capture whatever you can about that person. If you're a writer, you put in a book. If you're a painter, you put in your work. And that could be healing process for others to hear and see your process, because people need to know that they're not lonely. So this idea of creating works where you bring collectively our pains and happiness and sorrows, everything, that we share things, it's a very important thing. And when I was working on this piece, I wanted to kind of let viewers think that, yes, we are all deprived, we're not traveling. I want to create this journey that you are going back in time, imagining that you've been into this imaginary city. You're traveling so far away, but you're not. You're here. So I brought the art to you for you to be able to think that you traveled. So I think this is a very cool effect to heal this deprived time that we're in. Because most of us are deprived from traveling. So I think that's also an interesting way to, to share and give hope to live the next step. Um, so there are a number of questions that about, about memory that keep coming back. And I think, I think just one, one more um, to think about um, this, these things that we're looking at, and, you know, we all respond to them. I respond to them very strongly. I think I know, you know, I know I see a, a, a cylinder seal. I know that I see um, the gate of Ishtar. You know, I know that I, I, I know I have those references and I, and I'm, um, and I, and I love to sit and think about those and really, you know, kind of contemplate them as I'm looking, you know, at, at the artwork. And so the question I have is, you know, these pieces, you know, are these things that you know and that you have memories of, um, that you've seen, that you've traveled? I mean, we, we know that you've you know, lived in cities and, 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 and come to these pieces. Um, and in ways you've answered this, but just, you know, I think a lot of people have questions about you know, where, where are these things from? I was saying earlier that we have, I think, two types, of maybe even three types of memories. One, when you do things very quickly, you kind of surprise yourself that there's hidden feelings and emotions all of a sudden comes out. And when you start analyzing it, you understand where it comes from. But here, I did not give myself a chance to analyze where they're coming from. Because if I'm going to think about where they're coming from, first of all, I don't have the luxury of time to think about that. Second of all, I am interested in this almost when you put all the cards you just throw the cards, and then you all of a sudden you see them the way it arranged. You, you create your own story, like, like tarot cards. You create things based on that. So basically, they were like that. But obviously, they come from certain memories. I was saying could be influences or images and museum visits and uh, even certain types of food that, we, that I had. And it all comes here. But uh, for me, the most important thing is the way you said earlier, when you come, you, when you come to visit this piece, you are thinking about your own experience. So if you're in the theater, you start relating this to your theater experience. If you're into psychology and, and memory, you start analyzing this about your own experience. Maybe you even uh, relate this to your own experience with your own mother, with your own father, losing memory and all this. You start going there. And that's the beauty about the art that 
it could speak personally to the viewers and it becomes part of them. And that is very important for me, more than to say, oh, this is from this civilization or that civilization. Right. Um, I have a question, and we've talked about this, and I think, you know, one of related to you know, the work that you've done with music as well. What, can you talk a little bit about time and how time functions in your process of, of, of you know, how you make things, but also you know, what the experience you want us to have of your work would be? So in all of my works, the line only goes forward. It doesn't go backward. What I mean, n nothing I did here, I regretted or I erased. The performance is the same. Performance is, I'm um, creating the line. First of all, it's live. It doesn't matter whatever I created works or doesn't work, but I have to live with it. So the, the concept of thinking that you're living, you're accepting anything you create, it gives you this ease. It's not about wrong or right. It's about you being honest and expressing what you want to express. And they both become time-based. So when I'm creating the line, if I look to any of the pieces, I think maybe viewers can feel that. The line shows that it has a certain speed. So actually, I froze a time in that plate. When you're looking at drawing, drawing, the time is not frozen. You're creating and erasing, creating and erasing, even though they're both visual art. But here, I'm specifically interested in going only forward. The river is flowing in one direction, and I'm swimming in that direction. When you think you're going in the same direction, you accept anything comes out. You don't think about mistakes. There are no mistakes here. In life, there are no mistakes. We have to live with everything. Mm. And the role that time plays in, in my experience, in, in the viewer's experience of, of this piece, is that something that you, you, you consider? I mean. To me, this is not a piece I walk past, right? And you know, take a look and I say, oh, it's a still life and I, and I recognize some cherries and I move on. Um, you know, I've been here with you as you're making it, but then I expect that I'll keep coming back to this sort of over and, and over and over again. So, um, you know, it's when you think about the sort of viewing process, what are your hopes and, and expectations of your viewer? So there are two elements here I'm interested in. First of all, we visual artists were lucky if we uh, captivate someone more than 10 seconds. When you go visit the museum, it doesn't matter if it's uh, Van Gogh or Mona Lisa, visitors are there maybe like two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, doesn't matter. Yes. You could paint or create the work for 10 years. The visitors, they're going to give you two, three minutes. Here, I have two elements that I'm trying to explore. One, I'm assuming that I'm gonna capture them more than two, three minutes, because they're gonna walk through. That's gonna take time. And second, all of the works that I created, I wanted to age. The idea of age look, that's like a time it, in it, the time aged everything. It's interesting for me, and maybe when you look the piece close, closer, you, you understand it looks like a, it rubbed artwork, like almost like I took this blank sheet and I went to this old, historic site, and I just did this charcoal print out of it. It looks like that. So it means the work is there already. I only did this easy part. So when I'm creating that thing, it gives you the idea of what are those places? Can I visit them? So it's actually playing the idea of time, because you're thinking about the old time, and then meanwhile, they're walking through. And when you zoom out, no, this is a contemporary work. Mm -hmm. So you kind of took them to this journey, mm -hmm. almost like a fairy tale. You kind of tricked them and they come out of it with their own kind of perception of what is this. And they're affected. I mean, they've yes. they've, their time has been spent with of it. Of course, and yeah, in hopefully a positive way, yeah. Um, I, we have a question from Adrian, which is, is, is Memory Gates the first installation that you've created where the viewer can actually move through space and inhabit the beauty and history? Is this our, your first Yes. It's, walk? It's the first one that you walk in, yeah. not you walk next, like close to it. What I did, the memories of the stone was close to it, mm -hmm. but you cannot, I walked because the layers were very close just to, to feel, mm -hmm. to test if I can create something like this. So talk with us a little bit about the gates 
part? I mean, what is the, how is that part of this memory piece and what is the, why Gates for you? I remember growing up in Aleppo, each neighborhood is called under certain gate. So it's kind of you're crossing this from almost like a time zone to another time zone, civilization to another civilization. So, and it, there's something magical about almost like you could kind of change everything. Like you could leave all of your problems and, and issues behind the gate and you enter into, or vice versa. You could go in and learn something. So the idea of kind of entering, and I'm sure the visitors will feel the same thing when you're going in, you feel like you're almost entering a different dimension. And each time you need to think about, am I supposed to feel or learn something different? And that's already opens a new kind of possibilities for me. And I wanted to show almost like a, there's a time element here, this infinity. They're like, and the first two are drawing. The last ones are flat. So from here, it looks like it's infinitely going, those arches. Maybe they're like 10 of them or five. No, they're only two. So this idea of you think that through these gates, you're going to somewhere interesting, almost like a time machine. Well, for me, I mean, and when we talked, when we were in, you know, thinking about the, the theme here, for me, the gate is, is, you know, it's such an important part of a city landscape, right? Um, and the idea that you have these neighborhoods that are you know, marked by gates, that the different parts of the, you know, this is the, the Roman gate, this is this gate, or, you know, they have their own personalities to them, and they're attached to how people understand that area over long periods of time and the growth of that area. So that sort of urban, you know, those urban layers become really part of that, sort of that, that gate, that place. Um, and so for me, memories and gates you know, in this world of structure are entirely tied together. Um, and that monument is a piece in there as well, um, that monuments, you know, play a role in cementing our memories or creating our memories or constructing them for us. When I created uh, the short animation for Acts for Syria, I kind of built, kind of invented this uh, imaginary city where this city has seven gates. Each gate is looking at certain direction to welcome certain culture in. This is what something that I invented. I thought maybe in the past Aleppo or Damascus had that mm -hmm. because it's on trade route. Mm -hmm. So you need to think about, oh, they're guests, they're coming. They need to feel welcomed. So this concept where you create the gate and you let the visitor come in and they kind of feel something special about this trip has, a, of course, something before this, like the movie that I created. It did not happen only here. But somehow it developed from the movie, thinking about those seven, the kind of spiritual number seven. Mm. And then we have here uh, the idea of infinite gates that you're going somewhere and then you're gonna open. Maybe there's like a, another dimension behind this. It was an interesting thing to create this magical space. Gates. Yeah, and I know that I, I sent you copious emails about heavenly gates <laughs> and the idea that the gates mark you know, a space of utopianism, right? That inside mm -hmm. you know, this, these city walls, you've, you know, maybe you've created a place where where that, that would be considered, a, you know, where all languages are spoken and where all, you know, people live together in, in, in harmony. And I think there's an element in your work as well. You know, maybe it's not exactly this one. It's, the tow it's like the Tower of Babel where you have yes. this idea of us all, of this monument that we are all interacting with, um, sort of bringing us and language and ideas all to the same place um, where there's this kind of, cosmopolitan ideal. Yeah, I think Tower of Babel addressed that. And I was thinking, can I create a work where uh, it addresses very easy way about the diversity? Mm. And I was fortunate to create that work in London. And it was a great place to kind of address that. It doesn't matter where you come from, you're in front of 
installation or artwork that your ancestor were working there and all of us were speaking one language. Of course, it's a myth, but the concept is very beautiful. So we were all coming from this building. Of course, this building symbol symbolically is the Earth, this blue planet. When you zoom out, we're all here. Doesn't matter where you come from. We're kind of related and we need to be kind of tolerant and, and be in harmony with each other. And Tower of Babel addressed that. And I feel like after that, to come here to talk about just one civilization without thinking, oh, we're going only to one direction. This is just about us, all of us. You can see um, audience questions. And so CC says, I noticed that there are windows. Where can you see outside space? Will the surrounding space be considered in terms of where this installation will be hung? I mean, it is hung, so um, you can tell us a little bit about how you thought about windows and siding and when and you know this you were given this space we have we only have this space so how did you how did you, you know, adjust and think about how your piece would be in here so i'm going to speak in from one one direction one dimension which is you, you have more than one person is going in okay you're outside looking at the piece and someone is inside looking outside the piece and all of a sudden, you see the eye encounter. It's unexpected. So your home, especially during the pandemic, your home, from the window, you're kind of observing this, what's happening around you. And here, the same thing. The windows kind of, for me, I was thinking about that. Can they see each other? The visitors can somehow interact with each other without thinking about their interacting. They think an accident, but they're not. So almost like putting the visitors in on stage and thinking, oh, they're actors, without them knowing that they're actors. So, but at the same time, the way this piece is kind of creating this, we took the floor and somehow measured and see, look at it from every corner to think about every angle has different point of view and different way you see the piece and people see it and they get a different uh, information about it. So and from outside, you think this is it. That's the work. If you see from outside window, then you come here. You have completely different dimension. When you go in, there's another way to exit. So it's kind of a maze, but it's, I don't know. It just, just is, we just opened it, and I'm curious to see visitors' uh, point of view. You know. Yeah, that's Comments are welcome. <laughs> I want to hear their, their thoughts about <laughs> Always it. Always fascinating is, to see how people, yeah. do, I mean, you think one thing's going to happen and then something else entirely happens. I will say from you know curatorial point of view, uh, you know, this was a, a something that we sort of walked into without really a ton of sense of exactly what this was going to be. And we kind of you know, moved around, we tried this, we tried that, we looked at something, you know, we looked at different angles, we thought about different installations. That was part of the process of these 10 days. I mean, literally he had, you know, fabric on his shoulder. So the way that this ended up in this space has everything to do with us adjusting, trying, you know, moving, you know, doing all sorts of different things to figure out like really what this piece should do in this space related to the door, related to the window, related to ideas, all of it. Yeah, but there's one element that we forgot to talk about, What's that? which is the inside work. Yes, so I think there, the, there's a question about animation. So if you could address sort of the other piece yeah. of this. So uh, we're talking about the universality of this work, but I was also going to, because you arrive there and you see a door, you think you will relate that door to my own culture. It's almost like you came intimate to know me a little bit. Once you go in and that becomes more intimate, it, you will see me drawing in the, in the drawing. It's not, it's, there's a little bit of animation, but I captured myself drawing on a black paper. But I wanted to create something in, inspired, something like inspired by Syria or Aleppo and create this black hole in it. So I did a drawing, this large drawing, and I carved this oval hole. And through the hole, you will see me drawing. So that's inside. It, it's, I think it's playing now. So uh, we could experience that. <laughs> So it's like you're going from a piece that it's just about all of us, and then you go in and to learn about me a little bit more. So it's kind of an intimate way to discover the artist. You see me in action, hand, and all that. Yeah. So we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, we have a question from Virginia Ragan, which is a great question. How is this thing standing up? <laughs> what is the structure that we have here? 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how this is physically installed in this space? Yes. So uh, as an artist, when you work with materials, you learn more about how each material can work with each other. So recently I discovered that there's something material called Sintra, which is flexible and hard. They're almost like a foam, uh, foam core and foam boards. Mm. So I suggested to, to you guys and they ordered and it's all hung with double-sided tape. So when this exhibition is done, you could peel off all this and this entire exhibition could fit in little box. So it's like uh, this magic box could be stored Dream. and <laughs> later on the next destina destination you could hang it. So yeah, it's hanging from, from the ceiling. So the, the actual um, fabric does not touch the floor. And yes, it's suspended. Um, yes. <coughs> and we are, you move through and it moves with you and that's one of the most beautiful things about it is it's a organic living piece um, that sort of follows you as you, as you go through the space. And, um, one of my favorite things about it. Um, so there's a question here um, that I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask. Do you conjure pieces or this piece in your dreams? And I think you know, the sort of subconscious aspect of your, of your work is being... <coughs> I feel I'm not sure <coughs> it affects anything in my dream, but mm -hmm. when I wake up very, very early, I usually wake up between 4 and 5 a.m. And I started thinking about the process, how I'm building this. So <coughs> the first hour, maybe I'm in bed and building this. So I try to build this and think that, oh, it's done. When I arrive here, I already s saw some of the problem in this. So it's basically um, half awake, half asleep. I'm w working on it. And that's the best time for me to, to see if it's going to work or not. That's why if, when you see me in the morning, I come in and say, I have a different plan. Uh, and every you're morning. Like, oh, welcome. <laughs> let's change it. And every morning, I'm greeted with a cup of <coughs> coffee and a new plan. It was yes. <laughs> lovely. And you guys are <laughs> so kind to accept <laughs> all of the changes. Like, yes. Uh, I didn't see any surprise on any of these. Like, no, ten never cool a guys surprise. Hanging. Always, always <coughs> a solution. Um, so it, that sort of, I think, is a good way to 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 start thinking about the end. <laughs> so, what was you know. How, how was it working here with students? Um, so that's the first part of the question. And then we have a question from our Ariana that you can kind of um, just address, which is, you know, what kinds of advice would you give to students who are you know, thinking about their own work, their own, you know, their own voice as an artist? Um, what did, you know, as a young person, you know, what kinds of advice would you give them moving forward? I'll, I'll start with the second one. Okay. I don't think a student, they should think about their own voices. That's, <laughs> it could ruin your future. Voice should, <laughs> no. You only work and time will shape you who you are. And I give small example, like when someone starting to paint, I'm sure they'll put like 24 colors on the palette. In let's say 20 years later, maybe they'll choose two. To, to t the rest they will just get rid of. So for me, I'm using mostly black. You know, I got rid of most of the colors. But uh, the other one, it was uh, about working with students. It's a wonderful experience because you see they're dedicated. They come very often. They want to be part of everything. They're so excited about it. So that <coughs> dedication, that drive, it gives me the hope that I could give them a tiny bit of inspiration and even give all of the crafts. Anything I know, they can learn. I'm there to, to, to teach them. They're, they're witnessing everything from beginning until end. So I'm sure it's going to affect them in a positive way, and hopefully they could incorporate that in their life. It doesn't have to be this technique, but I'm sure any art form could influence another art form in a way to teach how to be risk-taking and, and, and more kind of honest about the approach that you want to do. Just with more work and trust your intuition and stay consistent, because if you don't trust yourself, no one is going to trust you. It starts from you and then in future, others, they will say, okay, come here and create the installation for us. Yeah. So I know that this has been kind of a, a you know, a different model for you. It's definitely been a different model for mm -hmm. us here at the Cantor, and we've really loved it. Um, it's just been, you know, such a joy to, to do this with you and be part of this process the whole time and invite people in to the space with you. Um, 
you know, we would love to hear about what your plans are for your next project and how can we keep following you and seeing you know, what you're doing. So I am working on an um, interesting uh, opera. Uh, it's about Andalusia. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be done with it and share it maybe end of next year with a wonderful composer. His name is Yezegel Vinao. Uh, and then uh, very soon, maybe in six months, um, I'll be done with a new project. It's called uh, Paper Pianos. It's about this refugee uh, a composer who is uh, from Afghanistan, who's not uh, allowed to play music. So it's like the simplest thing, we take it for granted. Um, some countries, they don't allow you to draw, they don't allow you to paint or to create music. So it's about that. And this guy was playing on a piano, a paper. He used to draw the piano on a paper, imagine the sound. So it's about that. I'm working with uh, a group, it's called uh, Alarm with Sound, and the composer is Mary Kyumjan. And uh, yeah, that's next thing. And I did a uh, couple of uh, small animations with Oswaldo Galiap. I'm hoping to continue that, to do the falling out of time. A couple more. So he wants me to do 70 minutes. I would love to do 70 minutes. I've done only three minutes so far. So <laughs> there's way to go, yes. I don't know how math works, but um, yes. that sounds like a lot. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and something that, uh, that I'm sure it would be great, I, your sort of dream project as you move forward. <laughs> Tell us about your dream. Dream okay. project. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I have two dream projects. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is, uh, can I take this and put it mm -hmm. in a public space where, let's say, outdoor space, and especially after COVID, need people want to, they, they feel more comfortable if they're in big gardens and all this. So I was thinking to take, I have huge library of drawings that I did yes, from inspired like for my movies and this and this. So I was thinking to work with graphic designer and, and build this huge maze where people can walk in and they get lost for mm -hmm. let's say an hour or two. So while they're there, they learn about different cultures. So that's a dream project. And then the other dream project is a bit spooky where it's kind of an interactive uh, project where uh, audience, they walk into the space, they don't see anything, it's empty. So my work will be hung flat. They don't see anything. They just see fabric hanging in the sky, in the ceiling. So when this motion sensor sees that there are people here, slowly the piece start to collapse on them. And they will be trapped in this cupola but from inside, you will see the type, my type of drawing. It looks like ancient city. And all of a sudden, you see the projectors projecting water. You'll hear sound of water, kind of almost like a drowning the city. In the meantime, everyone is like thinking that they got trapped in this place mm -hmm. and they're getting drowned. And they get the message about the losing historic sites and the climate change and all that. After 10 minutes, we'll raise that and we give them <laughs> <laughs> the chance to escape, <laughs> just leave. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, it, it, I, I, it's interesting to me because it's such a, you know, such an extension of what you've been developing. These, you know, drawing, printmaking, you know, film, all of these things, I mean, architecture, all kind of coming together into a multimedia piece. You know, I think I can see that very clearly as a project that happens in the future. I hope so. So. We say goodbye to Cave Work. Yes. We keep memory gates here. Enjoy it. Um, we also um, are, you know, just to express my gratitude one last time to you, it's been absolutely delightful. And for those of you who are watching at home, please come visit Memory Gates. Um, it will be up until April 11th. If you are college, uh, Holy Cross College community, you can come Monday through fri Friday, 10 to 5. If you are not, you can, make, you can call and make an appointment with us to come visit. So um, anybody can come as long as they call us and make an appointment. And please visit the website www.memorygates.holycross.edu. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you soon. See you soon.